Before the formal proceedings of the evening, I do want to say a few words about the larger context for this event. This is the third of three annual lectures on aspects of museum studies that will honor the life and work of Patricia Weitzel. She was former director of the University of Michigan's Detroit Observatory, located near the medical campus and now a part of the Bentley Library. Uh, Patricia Weitzel was born on March 22, 1950 in Ann Arbor, and she was a graduate of Olivet College. She began working at the University of Michigan in 1973, and her appointment included service as Director of Financial Aid in the law school, and later as Assistant to the Vice President for Research. While working full-time, she earned both an MA and a PhD uh, from the School of Education here. It was while serving with former Vice President uh, for Research, Homer Neal, that uh, Patricia Weitzel developed a proposal to restore the, Detroit, the university's Detroit Observatory. The structure was built on the hill, uh, then considered quite remote from the central campus in 1854 by Henry Philip Tappan, the first president of the university. And this was part of uh, Tappan's larger vision for what he hoped the university would be, not only a teaching institution, but also a research uh, institution. But over the years, from 1854 to uh, about 1985, the, uh, the, the, uh, d d the d observatory uh, really had fallen into decline and was in need of serious attention. So in 1994, uh, Weitzel began her award-winning four-year restoration of the observatory, eventually writing a book on the project, all the while continuing to work at the uh, Office of the Vice President for Research. In 1998, she was appointed the newly created, to the newly created position of director and curator of the Detroit Observatory, and under her leadership, the building served as a center for 19th century uh, and museum studies. When ill health forced her into retirement in 2005, responsibilities for the observatory passed to the Bentley Library. On, June, on July 30th, 2006, she died peacefully at home following a three-year struggle with cancer. So we are pleased uh, tonight to continue this lecture series to honor her work in transforming the Detroit Observatory. And I invite all of you to look for our open house schedule and come and visit it if you haven't seen it already. It's a observatory still with its original equipment put there uh, by Tappan in 1854. So through this process, we all learned a great deal about the purpose and use of objects. In this case, a large complex object. So I'm particularly pleased that uh, this lecture series co-sponsored with the program in museum studies uh, 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 explores some of the difficulties we have in representing and interpreting objects to a wider public. I also want to thank Ray Silverman and Brad Taylor and all those connected with the Museum Studies uh, program for joining with us in this very fruitful uh, collaboration. So now it gives me pr great pleasure at this point to introduce Ray Silverman, director of the program in Museum Studies. This program jointly sponsors the, these lectures and Ray has been director of the Museum Studies program for the past seven years. So he will introduce uh, tonight's speaker. So, Ray. Thank you, Fran. Um, thank you all for coming uh, this evening. I'm delighted to welcome you to the third annual Weitzel Lecture that we have organized in collaboration with the Bentley Historical Library. The last two Weitzel Lectures were presented by prominent museum practitioners, first Alice Greenwald and later Harold Scramstad. It is fitting that this year's Weitzel Lecture will be given by a scholar whose interdisciplinary work finds itself at the cusp of contemporary museum research practice and theory. Tonight, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Sharon McDonald as our speaker. Sharon McDonald's anthropological training began as an undergraduate in human science at the University of Oxford, where she went on to complete her PhD in social anthropology. Her doctoral research examined social and linguistic identity in the Scottish Hebrides that was based on ethnographic fieldwork in the Isle of Skye. Her thesis was published in 1997 under the title of Reimagining Culture, Histories, Identities, and the Gaelic Renaissance. Currently, Sharon MacDonald is a professor of social anthropology at the University of Manchester in England, where her teaching focuses on politics, construction, and appropriation of identity and heritage. <clears throat> 
Before joining the faculty at Manchester in 2006, Professor McDonald spent 10 years as a professor of cultural anthropology at the University of Sheffield. Previous academic appointments include work in the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology at Keele University and at the Center for Research into Innovation, Culture, and Technology at Brunel University. Professor McDonald was visiting scholar at the Institute for uh, European Ethnology at Humboldt University um, between 2006 and 7. And in 2000 and 2003, she was a visiting fellow at the Institute for Sociology at the Friedrich Alexander University. Professor McDonald's scholarship is remarkable for its breadth and the impact it, is, it has had in the interdiscipline of museum studies. Let me highlight just a few of her many publications. In the area of exhibition of science and technology, she has produced two books, an edited volume titled The Politics of Display, Museums, Science, Culture, and a monograph, Behind the Scenes at the Science Museum. On questions of theory and exhibition practices, she is the author of numerous articles and the editor of two recent volumes. First, a companion to Museum Studies, published by Blackwell in 2006, and very recently, Exhibition Experiments, which she co-edited with Paul Basu. There has been a proliferation in the last five years of anthologies of museum studies. Sharon McDonald's Companion to Museum Studies is, hands down, the best. It is, in fact, it serves as the core source of readings for our graduate pro seminar in museum studies here at the University of Michigan. Professor McDonald's most recent publication and the topic of tonight's Weitzel Lecture is Difficult Heritage, Negotiating the Past in Nuremberg and Beyond. In this important work, she looks at how <coughs> Nazi heritage sites have been used, ignored, and museumized. This compelling and fascinating project has been in the works since 1999 and came to fruition in 2006 and 7 when Professor McDonald received uh, a, a, a United Kingdom Arts and Humanities Research Council Award and held an Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Professor McDonald is an active member of several professional and academic organizations, including the Association of Social Anthropologists, the European Association of Social Anthropologists, and the European Association of Science and Technology Studies. She is also a fellow of the Royal Anthropological Institute. In keeping with her prolific research and writing agendas, Professor McDonald is, one, is on the editorial boards of several journals, including the Anthropological Journal of European Cultures, Anthropology in Action, the International Journal of Heritage Studies, Memory Studies, Museum and Society, and Tourism and Culture Change. Professor McDonald is one of today's leading scholars of museums and heritage. With her diverse interests that lie both in practice and in research, she is the ideal person to speak to us about the issues and complexities surrounding the commemoration and use of contested heritage sites. Please join me in welcoming Sharon McDonald to U of M. Thank you very much indeed for that absolutely um, uh, humbling, splendid introduction. Um, it's a real privilege to uh, be here, and I really would like to thank very, very much um, the Bentley Historical Society um, for supporting this lecture, um, and to thank uh, Ray Silverman um, and Bradley Taylor for uh, inviting me and for organizing. I've been here um, since late on Saturday. Oh, okay. Can you hear, hear me okay? better now? Sorry about that. Um, you just hear my thanks now. Um, for so I, I arrived late on Saturday, and I've had just an amazing week of meeting people, um, eating all sorts of wonderful uh, food, and seeing sites that I thought I'd only seen in the movies uh, before. So it's been, been really great and uh, a, a very, very great privilege uh, to be here. Um, so I'll begin, begin my lecture. 
So in 2001, the documentation center of the former Nazi party rally grounds in Nuremberg was opened by German president Johannes Rau. Concerned with the Nazi past and especially the Nuremberg rallies, this contained the former site of the Nuremberg rallies um, it, and it contained a documentation center. And this is a dramatic architectural intervention into one of the colossal Nazi buildings at the site, a building known as the Congress Hall. Designed by Austrian architect Gunter Dominik, the structure was conceptualized as a stake or a spear through the heart of the Nazi building, the glass and steel design providing a literal and metaphorical cutting into the build building, offering a view into its interior and out over the wider site beyond. So you can see something of it there, and you see it a bit better, I think, in um, the, the sketch uh, for that. Do you want it up a bit? Yeah. Although the Congress Hall was not, in fact, designed by Hitler's favorite architect, Albert Speer, who did design much of the rest of the site, the idea of Dominic's design as a spear into spear, a pun that works in German as well, took off in the local and international press. So too did the idea that this represented a significant, even revolutionary point in the city's, and for some even the nation's, uh, historical consciousness. At last, it was said, the city was facing up to its past. It was a transformation akin to that of Saul on the road to Damascus, elevating Nuremberg from pariah to saintly status. Creating such a center undoubtedly was highly politically charged, and the presence of important national and even international figures helped to affirm it as such. It had, after all, taken more than half a century since the end of the war to create a permanent educational resource and acknowledgement of Nuremberg's Nazi past, and more than two decades since active campaigns by history activists in the city to do something of the sort. Now, in coming to display its difficult heritage at the turn of the century, Nuremberg was not unusual. If the second half of the 20th century has been one of heritage boom or memory epidemic, as some have dubbed it, one significant strand of this, which seems to have gathered momentum towards the century's end and into this, is the turn to unsettling and awkward histories. Museums of Holocaust, for example, have been set up in many countries across the world, including in countries such as Australia and the US, uh, which are not direct sites of Holocaust. Um, there the being over uh, 20 such museums in the US alone, um, the vast majority of which have opened since uh, 1993 when the Holocaust Memorial Museum opened. Other difficult topics that have recently become the focus of massive, massively increased exhibitionary attention include colonialism and so often, the so often linked subject of slavery. For example, this century has seen the opening here in the US of various exhibitions connected with the Underground Railroad, most notably the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, um, but still no federally funded Museum of Slavery. And in the UK, there have been at least a dozen major exhibitions and also an international uh, museum of slavery um, that opened in 2007 as part of the bicentennial commemoration of abolition. Now clearly there are important differences between many of these examples of public display of difficult heritage. A Holocaust museum in Poland has a different relation to its location than does one in, in Australia. A museum of slavery in Liverpool, UK, is positioned differently from one on Gorry Island, Senegal. In many cases, the impetus to create such museums and exhibitions has come primarily from those who suffered under the atrocity or their descendants. In others, and I would include Nuremberg, the push has come primarily from those who are not part of these groups and who might even be identified as descendants of perpetrators. What is a work here then is a mix of circumstances and motives. 
But despite the, the differences, all a testament, I suggest, to a changing moral landscape and historical consciousness in which not acknowledging difficult histories is increasingly likely to be viewed as forgetting, evasion, or cover-up. A shift of victimhood from a shameful status to one to be embraced and sided with is another premise of the public display of these topics. In many cases, this is bound up, too, with a way of couching political demands as retributions for wrongs suffered that's part of a broader politics of identity. Also involved, I think, is a bigger appetite among the, an international public for acting as what, in my book, I call moral witnesses. By visiting such sites and showing themselves willing to devote time and energy to understanding these histories, people effectively make moral statements. They affirm their concern. In my interviews with visitors at the documentation center and, and the surrounding area, I was struck by the effort that so many people had made to make such a visit, perhaps traveling considerable distances and at personal expense. And at the sense of moral duty, one ought to make such an effort that they expressed. It was a kind of paying respect, um, a metaphorical wreath laying. Um, and of course, at many sites, though not um, at this one, um, provision is made for commemorative activity, uh, such as lighting candles. What Levy and Snyder observe about the Holocaust seems more generally relevant here too. Their observation is that memory has become increasingly cosmopolitan in that events may be commemorated that are not directly part of a nation's or an in individual's own past. The Holocaust has become part of all of our pasts. Perhaps this cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism is also an attempt to overcome some of the potential tribalism of identity politics. But let me here return to the Nuremberg case and tell something of this road to Damascus story. As with most allegories, when you dig into the details, the story is more complicated. Um, and I hope to be able to convey just a little of this here. But mainly what I want to do is to tell you something about the nature of the struggle in Nuremberg with the city's difficult heritage and some of the different approaches to it over the years, up to its most recent realization. Because we see in this, I think, something of the range of approaches that may be taken to difficult heritage uh, more generally, and some of their dilemmas, implications, and potentials. So Nazism and ensuing war devastated much of Nuremberg. Allied bombing left the beautiful medieval old town and much of the surrounding area in ruin. The population was decimated, tens of thousands of people being displaced. The city's name was also tarnished. From henceforth, especially among foreigners, Nuremberg would signify <coughs> the Nuremberg Laws, the racist legislation which denied Jews rights as citizens, the Nuremberg Rallies, the mass Nazi spectacles of national strength, and the Nuremberg Trials, the international tribunal held by the Allies to try Nazi criminals. The city was also left with massive physical reminders of the Nazi regime, especially the former Nazi party rally grounds. This was a vast site a few kilometers from the old town that was built, though only partly completed, for the staging of the rallies. So held here once a year between 1933 and 1938, these were week-long events in which hundreds of thousands of people participated. Many did so as part of organized displays in which Nazi c capability was choreographed to the centimeter. Others came as spectators. The rallies were also filmed, so famously by Lenny Riefenstahl, and viewed by hundreds of thousands of others around the country. The rallies were, in other words, part of the apparatus of Nazi self-realization, technologies for enlisting to the Nazi project. They did so by a performance of unity and collectivity 
and by the making evident of military and organizational capacity. They were, in other words, part of the technology of enchantment that made Nazism so attractive to so many. And a key feature of this technology was the physical architecture of the site. This was carefully designed, the area being uh, largely cleared of previous structures, um, though some buildings remained and were adapted. But for the most part, this was a stage on a grand scale, involving massive, costly building work and the lives of many slave laborers. The central area, and if I just show you that, is so you'll see that building there is the Congress Hall building that I showed you already. This, this uh, central area here um, is about nine kilometers square. Um, and the whole larger area that the whole map shows you, which includes areas of barracks for people who are staying um, when they came to, to um, participate in the, the rallies, that's about 22 square kilometers. Probably the most famous building is the Zeppelin building. Um, and like the Congress Hall, this is a massive structure, its size being exaggerated by these long lines of repeating pillars. And this was part of a calculated violation of human scale, as it was actually, as, as uh, Albert Speer himself later wrote, in which the individual was supposed to feel overawed by the sheer scale of the buildings, and so to receive the Nazi message directly and, un and emotionally uh, unmediated by reason. There was also a sheer lust for size, a gigantomania, as it's sometimes referred to as, uh, involved in this. Now, Hitler's uh, gigantomania, and I'm sorry the images are not, not so clear, probably, especially for those of you at the back, the, the, there's Hitler, there's uh, uh, Speer, Albert Speer, and this guy on the left is the um, actual architect of this particular building. His name's uh, Ludwig Ruf. And you'll see, in, so this is a model of the Congress Hall building, um, and you'll see in the background the actual building. Um, and it said that um, Hitler sent the architects back three times uh, to make the building bigger until at last it was bigger than its precursor, the Roman uh, Colosseum. Um, so he's there wanting to, you know, it, it to be made uh, bigger, bigger than the, the design at that time. Other stories of this sort uh, that are told are to do with the great German stadium that was being built on the site. And that was intended to have 400, uh, space for 400,000 spectators, um, larger, I'm told, than any stadium in existence today. We might know some exceptions. It was, in any case, so, so large that people at the back would have been unable to see, and it would have contravened uh, Olympic standards. But on being told this, apparently Hitler uh, simply replied that that latter was irrelevant because in the future um, all the Olympics would be held there anyway and the rules would be uh, written uh, by him. Now all that remains of the stadium today is the founding stone and a lake where the foundations were dug um, because that's all that had been completed by the end of the war. But other areas included vast marching grounds and, and a number of other um, uh, buildings and towers and a strength through Joy Village. Now the last and some of the smaller structures were destroyed by war bombing but most of the grounds and buildings were left intact though some had still not been quite completed. But even damaged and without their Nazi banners or the crowds of participants, the site clearly remained that of the Nazi rallies and the buildings <coughs> clearly remained Nazi uh, buildings. So what happened to them after the end of the war? How did the city cope with this very large physical reminder of Nazism within its boundaries? And to what extent uh, might we say that the place carried with it something of the past, perhaps even its intended capacity to enthrall, to overwhelm, to enchant the spectator into a sense of admiration and perhaps even into enthusiasm for its Nazi creators and their ambitions? Well, in the immediate aftermath of war, there was a shortage of solid buildings, and so the buildings were put to use. 
um, perhaps with a calculated irony. They were used for um, holding Nazi criminals awaiting trial, uh, the, the Congress Hall was, and other parts were used for storage. Nuremberg, as part of Bavaria, was in the American zone, and several parts of the site uh, were used by the US military. Um, and there was quite a lot of haggling over time, um, so military and other purposes, um, haggling over time about the use of the buildings between the two. Um, but um, the city had uh, sole use of most of the buildings um, and a joint use of, um, of, 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 of almost all the rest by, by the 1950s, except for a few exceptions, like the former SS barracks, um, which uh, the US kept until 1992. Um, but it wasn't only the US soldiers who used it for leisure. Um, prior, prior to its takeover by the Nazis, the whole area had been a very popular public park. Um, and local people began, after the war, local people began reclaiming it once again, uh, putting Nazi buildings to new uses, as here um, playing tennis up the back uh, side of the uh, Zeppelin building, which is very popular today. People go along and take their tennis balls and hit them against uh, th that building. Um, and this also provided a, a space for local people to uh, get to know uh, US soldiers, and quite a number of people that I, I interviewed told me about their memories um, of being given sweets by, uh, by soldiers as children. Um, and the popular practice of holding barbecues in this area is said to have been begun by the Amis, as local people uh, refer to, 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 the, to, to the Americans. From the early 1950s, uh, motor racing resumed at the site, and then the biannual uh, Volksfest, the local fair, um, which happens right next door the, to the Congress Hall um, and continues today, um, those were all returned, and there was really very little question about whether that was appropriate or not. From this perspective of today, some of this might look like a form of forgetting. As some of the foreign visitors to the site that I've interviewed have asked, how can people even think of doing something like that there, given the history of the place? Several expressed to me the idea that it was somehow sacrilig sacrilegious, or um, as one said, an affront to the Holocaust and Jews. Others, that it, it was a denial of the past. And for some, it just sort of seemed somehow distasteful or inappropriate. But there were others who expressed astonishment that the buildings still existed at all and thought they should have been destroyed as vestiges of Nazism straight after the war. And from just really for just a minority of other, uh, of other foreigners, um, it was somehow refreshing that the place was not used in any semi-religious way, but just it was in some way being tra transgressed. But how was it seen at the time and since? Trying to figure out how people are seeing and understanding their worlds and to see past the assumptions we might begin with um, and how they do, uh, um, the, past the assumptions that we might begin with about how they do so, is one of the things that anthropologists try to do. Now, in my case, this has been through a mix um, of using historical sources of participant observation ethnography, in other words, hanging out, um, and interviews um, with people using the place, some of whom um, have done so for a very long time, um, and with various people who've been involved in different aspects of decision making um, to do with the site over the years. Well, we've already seen one reason um, why it came to be used in various ways and why it wasn't raise, raised to the ground. Um, in the post-war shortage of buildings, these were just there to be used. Also important, however, was that they seemed to have been viewed as ritually purged. One of the first acts of the Allies was to remove swastikas. So on the 24th of April, 1945, the massive gilded swastika on the Zeppelin building was draped with the stars and stripes and blasted away. This was undoubtedly symbolically powerful. But that very fact meant that it, wasn't regard it, that meant that it was regarded as enough. And so other things that might perhaps look odd to us today 
were not, it seems, even contemplated. If involved here too, however, um, and over-determining the retention of the buildings, um, were the ways in which the City Council uh, made its economic calculations. So City Council minutes record detailed calculations of the expenditure that the city, and that was the terms in which this was thought about, um, that the city had made under the Nazis to construct these buildings, and that was conceptualized as investment. Now, as such, officials um, in, in the post-war years regarded themselves as somehow compelled to recoup on that investment. And they tried to do so, in particular, um, uh, by, by renting out the, the buildings, hiring them for use of storage or music practice rooms and so on. But the problem was that the buildings weren't just money earners. Um, they rapidly fell, fell into disrepair, and they needed expenditure to maintain them. And undoubtedly, from the, these uh, city council minutes, the thing that the council was most occupied over the years with was how to balance the books and deal with buildings that they regarded as a burden, not so much for historical and symbolic reasons, but because of their physical and costly upkeep. And it was calculations of this sort that led um, to a decision to amputate the Zeppelin building at the end of the 1960s. Um, so what happened in this were that its big side galleries were exploded off. And you'll see there, without those, so the center of the building is actually um, uh, over there, um, it, it's, it's really truncated and it is, I think, much less visually uh, powerful as, as a building. Despite the Nazis' aims to constitute them as a Third Reich that would last for a thousand years, the buildings had mostly been constructed um, very poorly and uh, even just uh, uh, a decade later were showing signs of weather damage. So much so that according to the city building officers, um, the side galleries were becoming dangerous, creating a possibility that people might be hit by falling masonry. So removing these side galleries, according to the officials, um, was resolving, um, was the only way of resolving this problem um, within a tight financial budget. But there is, however, another story um, about this that circulates in Nuremberg. Um, just under two years uh, before these were um, uh, blasted off, and this was in 1967, um, a local newspaper reported that a visiting student from Israel had pointed out that Nuremberg um, still had swastikas on open display. And what he was referring to were actually the ceilings uh, within these side galleries. And these had a design, and I'm afraid you really won't see this, this, this very well here, um, but you can maybe just see it in the top corner there, a sort of design within which a swastika um, is embedded. Um, now, the council were really annoyed about this, um, and they'd been setting up these sort of links um, with uh, Jewish groups as um, sort of post-war reconciliation, and they reacted extremely defensively, so they, they wheeled out a curator from the Germanic National Museum, um, to, and this is the newspaper article about it, and he shows a vase on which there is this same, he says, the same uh, uh, meander pattern from ancient Greece. Um, it does really seem to rather miss, miss the point, I think. Um, but it's, it's a hard story to get to the bottom of, you know, which really, really caused, was the, the, the preemptive um, event for the, the, the destroying of the side galleries. Um, it is the case that the council had been really worried about what to do about um, the, the building, but the idea of completely blasting them off doesn't seem to have been on the agenda. So that's where that was at. Um, but one issue that wasn't mentioned in the discussion about the Zeppelin building at the time, but late, that later became the subject of much debate, was over whether there might be dangers of other kinds in letting the buildings fall into disrepair and ruin. In Albert Speer's memoirs, he talks about what he calls a theory of ruin value, 
um, claiming that this informed the design and construction of major Nazi buildings. Based on the idea that ancient classical buildings um, had, um, or were like the Roman Colosseum, had over time sort of disintegrated to form rather attractive ruins, Speer claimed that his buildings had been built uh, to do likewise. Now, there's been a lot of controversy about this um, um, amongst architects and others, and whether that really was part of his original architectural uh, theory and practice, or whether he dreamed it up later. But whichever, um, it set up a dilemma in Nuremberg um, as the city with the country's largest, most striking, and most visibly decaying Nazi buildings. If the city allowed them to fall into ruin, would it be fulfilling the intended Nazi ambition for them? And was it the case, as Speer had proposed, that there was something specially compelling about the ruin for the German psyche? Might the buildings, in other words, come to gather more power to enthrall as they crumbled away? Well, one solution was to prevent further decay through conservation. Um, and some of that has happened over time, especially since um, the, the early 1970s when the buildings were listed under heritage conservation law. But it was always done pretty grudgingly and fairly minimally. And there was also a symbolic risk here too of being seen to restore uh, Nazi grandeur and might and perhaps restoring the original impact of the buildings. Well, a solution was proposed by the city's culture minister, Hermann Glaser. And he drew on Hannah Arendt's ideas about the banality of evil. And he proposed what he called a banalization or profanation or trivialization, all these words get, get, get used in these debates, uh, a strategy. And what this meant was maintaining the buildings in a kind of untidy halfway uh, state. So not fully restored, but not falling quite into ruin either. So it also meant um, that the ordinary, everyday, banal uses of the site that were going on for storage, for the tennis playing that you've seen, for the motor racing, um, and other activities um, that had begun, like rock concerts, very popular as you see, um, which uh, began in 1972 with Bob Dylan, first, first up. <laughs> um, that these could all be kind of claimed as part of this strategy of profanation. In practice, it was pretty much business as usual. Um, but there could be profanation too far. In 1987, a private company came to what the council at first thought was its rescue. Um, rescue from having to pay out uh, for the increasingly costly repairs to the Congress Hall, especially to, it, to its, its, its roof. Um, and what was proposed, after a lot of a very serious consultation with relevant parts of the City Council and, uh, and widespread approval, um, was that the company would transform uh, the Congress Hall into a high-class shopping and leisure center with luxury restaurants, a hotel, golf driving ranges, it was a really big place, um, swimming pools, and a disco. And that, that's the plans they drew up um, there. And this got cross-party support. Um, but when it was reported in the local press, there was a flurry of responses from members of the pu public expressing, often in really wonderfully uh, colorful and ironic language, but expressing astonishment and anger, um, and many accusing the council of repressing the past. Um, and in the end, the proposal um, was withdrawn. Just as a side note, I should say that if you thought that was maybe a bit extraordinary, um, in Weimar in 2005, 
um, one of the other very, very big um, Nazi buildings, uh, the Gau Forum, uh, that's there in the center um, of Weimar. This has been transformed, uh, or in 2000 it was opened, as an extremely kitschy um, shopping center called the Atrium. And there's a picture of it. Um, but one thing that I found really interesting in this debate um, in the mid-80s was that it was really the first time in this context, and it's, it's the sort of thing you can see if you look in real detail at one particular kind of case. It was the first time, really, that a certain way of talking about things uh, came about. Terms like, um, like um, repression, so Verdrängung in, in German, um, and this was the first time as well that, um, th th that a term that I put there in the middle, this term Mahnmal was used. Now this is a term um, that draws on the usual word that's used for a monument, Denkmal, but it replaces the root of that um, with part of, um, so, so the, the, the verb that means to admonish or to warn is Mahnen. So it, it creates this new sort of, um, noun of something that's a sort of warning monument. And, and that that's, um, was the first time that this was used in relation uh, uh, to, the, to these buildings. But it was being used more widely um, in Germany at the time. And, and now it's become part of the really standard discourse um, in commemoration and pedagogical uh, initiatives against forgetting. So warning monuments remind us of the past uh, so that we remember not to act in the same ways in future. Now, while there have been some attempts and various proposals to use the site educationally before this episode, there followed a flurry of activity. What seemed to change in particular was that the idea of doing nothing um, also became a meaningful act. So it wasn't just doing things like turning Nazi buildings into shopping centers or cinemas that were reg regarded as an example of forgetting the past. Now, so too was not acting. So profanation no longer seemed like a sufficient and even a credible strategy. Driven especially by various young hi history activists, many of whom came from the university, um, but also in relation to wider moves elsewhere in Germany um, towards commemoration, and especially the commemorations that were linked with the 40th, uh, various 40th anniversaries um, that came up in the 1980s, we see some of the first attempts to publicly display the history of the site. And that included things like information boards, temporary exhibitions, and various artworks. And there were also increasingly ambitious proposals for what to do with the whole site. Um, some really quite extraordinary sort of ideas of turning it into great artworks. Um, and during the 19, into the 1990s too, a number of competitions were held of ideas of what can we do with this place. Though pr none of them really, uh, and there was this sort of cycle of competitions which never announced a winner. Um, but there's not time to look at these in, in, in detail, but they are rather interesting as different strategies. Um, and they offer a whole set of varied ideas about how you might deal with difficult and uncomfortable pasts. But just very briefly, quite a number of them draw on ideas about nature. They do have ideas that what you'll do is plant trees. And one even had this idea that you turn the Congress Hall into this sort of giant greenhouse. Um, and thus, in their terms, that they would sort of counter Nazi poison through nature. Um, some have also proposed religious approaches, suggesting artworks and education about world religions as another kind of way of countering what's seen as uh, as the debased a-religiosity of the Nazis. And still others have pro proposed metaphors, artworks, um, and architectural structures which variously frame, decompose, fragment, pierce, cut through, uh, or cut through the site and the buildings. Um, as does uh, the documentation center, as we saw um, at the beginning. And so that idea, that cutting through, together with the uh, educational emphasis on documentation is what won out of those competitions. Well, as this is a lecture that's linked to a museum studies program, I probably should say here something about the fact that this is not a museum, and it's very self-consciously self um, 
uh, said to not be a museum. So it's very important to those who are inv involved. And when it was being made, um, I, I at one point sort of just referred to it as all people, local people did as, oh, you know, when the museum is opened. And I, I was stopped. It's not, not a museum. It's a documentation center. Um, and the reason it was seen, it was important for people that it wasn't a museum, even though it's under the museum's uh, service, um, was that it wouldn't collect um, artifacts of the period, um, but it would have documentation. Um, and the idea of the emphasis on documentation, really, that that was seen as very serious, as reliable. The materials of proper history and of historians. A museum, by contrast, was seen as endowing its subject matter with a kind of validation and even worth. And partly as such, and partly on account of an idea that objects are potentially more unruly in the meanings that they might convey, a museum risked a kind of enchantment. And at a site like that, that was seen as potentially especially problematic. Nevertheless, the Documentation Center does contain um, an exhibition. Um, and indeed, that's the main part of it, and is why people go, um, for the most part. And that's an exhibition called Fascination and Terror. Um, and what it does is it, it explains about the rise and the course of Nazism, and more specifically about the role of propaganda, the building of the rally grounds uh, uh, site, and the events staged there. It's a serious exhibition. It's quite text heavy, um, with relatively few uh, objects and reconstructions, uh, though, though it does have some. And it does have this emphasis on documentation, and especially photography and film. And it's certainly a very impressive um, achievement. But is it a facing up to the past? Well, in a sense it is, in that it's a major space for public education, and in that, at last, this part of the city's past um, is thoroughly on the tourist agenda. It's actually included in tourist guides and tourist maps. Um, I looked through lots and lots of tourist literature for this research, and older maps always seem to just cut short just before they would uh, reach this site, and there were no signs for many, many years for how to, to get to this site. Um, so it's included in this. Um, and as this is a permanent exhibition for the first time, we can say that there's now some substantial commitment to history at last. But perhaps it's also, um, it performs a kind of historical ceiling, a final marking of the past as past, not as forgotten, but nevertheless as somehow distanced from the present. The final major part of fascination and terror is a section about the Nuremberg trials. And that's one of the few reconstructions. And although my photograph really doesn't show it, and especially in this not very bright version, um, and it is, it is a very dark part of the exhibition, which is partly what I think gives it its emotive power too. Um, but it is quite a, a visually um, powerful section. Um, and it is, I think, intended as a sort of last dramatic flourish at the end of the exhibition. And it also is a very powerful and positive place to end the story with the trying and hanging of Nazi criminals and the ushering in of more international procedures for human rights. But it can also so easily imply that everything is now sorted out and finished. Good has triumphed over evil. And that's the case, too, in a little section that follows as you go out into the corridor. And that's a section about the history of the Congress Hall building itself. And it gives um, some examples about ideas about what to do with the building in the past, like turn it into a big football stadium or the shopping center example. But it, too, ends happily, as the visitor already knows, um, with the construction of the documentation center. The visitor can visit the center, can exit the center, sorry, can exit the center comfortably now after this trip into dark history, knowing that it's all been addressed and resolved. Now, perhaps that's too cynical, and I wouldn't want to detract too much from the achievement of those making the center, 
for, of its realization, or the understandings of those who visit, which is a, another matter about which I could say more um, in discussion if you like. But let me just end by briefly noting a strategy used in an earlier temporary exhibition on the same topic. There, at the end of the exhibition, there was a notice board, um, and the whole exhibition was really made on a, a, an absolute shoestring budget. So this is just an ordinary notice board. But what happened there was they would pin up articles that had been in the newspapers in recent weeks. And these would be articles about things like a desecration of a Jewish cemetery, uh, an attack on foreigners and things, and there never seemed to be a shortage of supply of re such, recent, uh, such recent articles. So these were very strong reminders that the hit history witnessed was perhaps not so distant as, and past as might otherwise be implied. Well, I hope in this lecture that I've managed to get, convey something of the difficulties of negotiating, the, of negotiating Nazi heritage. As we see a growth in attempts to tackle awkward and unsettling subjects in museums and other forms of public display, we also see more and more some of the contests and challenges that arise. Nuremberg doesn't offer straightforward lessons um, in what to do, but it does highlight some of the various possible strategies and some of their implications. It also tells us, I think, that that very idea of getting something sorted once and for all for that Paulian transformation is not only unlikely, but is perhaps a misguided aspiration in the field of difficult heritage. Negotiating the past meaningfully, especially the difficult past, needs always to be ongoing. It needs, in other words, to resist becoming past itself. Thank you very much. Yes. I think so. I mean, when I decided to do the work on Germany, it was partly because I did feel that Germany had really, I suppose, gone further than many, many other places. And so while I partly am being critical, and I think that people who've looked at many other sites, there's often that, that, that's something that comes out, out too. I think that shouldn't detract from the fact that the, there has been that attempt. And I, I think the important thing is that it does then, it does become ongoing. I, there often are sort of forces who do want to kind of seal it and settle it. So these, these things always are in this kind of struggle and negotiation. Um, but there's also a lot of will to address uh, this past. So I do think, yeah, I mean, I do think that Germany has, um, in many ways, I think, has led, led the way. But I mean, the, the, there are many different examples too. And I, I suppose I think as well some of the kind of artwork reminders that are used in some cities, the things like these, um, they're called Stolpersteine, are uh, uh, set into pavements, cobblestones that kind of remind you of uh, uh, Jewish households that were in the area. And that, those kinds of moves have, uh, are often very progressive as well. Yeah. Well, lots of questions. Uh, just in front of the one before. Uh, it's obviously very expensive for the city of Nuremberg to be redesigning and yeah. evaluating this every few years. Is it the sole responsibility of the city, or is the country also feeling that it's their obligation, its obligation as well? Yeah, that's a that's, um, very good point. For many years, one big uh, reason that nothing happened was that Nuremberg really, really re resented the idea that they should take this on as a city. Um, and the funding for this particular center was actually divided. Well, it, it, it was initially there was some 
private funding that was dependent on uh, matching funding from the council. But there was, um, for the first time for this, the state, in this case, which is Bavaria, uh, provided part of the money, and so did the country, which was uh, un unprecedented in, in this city. So it has been, it has been shared um, for the first time. So yes, mm. yeah. Yeah, um, I'm surprised you didn't mention, and maybe it's just my fantasy imagination working here, uh, whether or not the events of 1989 changed the tone mm. of things. You, you know, yeah. one would be tempted to imagine, for example, that post-89 things would get mm. a lot easier because this could be turned into not a, a monument to the evils of Nazism, mm. but the evils of totalitarianism, bringing mm. in all of this stuff about the crimes of the Stasi, et cetera, mm -hmm. and, and in a sense sort of diluting, in my opinion certainly, diluting mm. the, the explicitly anti-Nazi um, sort of agenda that any kind of site that this might have, and probably mm. actually satisfying a lot of right-wingers uh, who kind of agree with the anti-communism that the Nazis had. Mm. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That that is part of the story. It's quite interesting because in the, even pre-1989, because things were in the air, I suppose, um, there was uh, a, a, a kind of, because there was so much criticism within the West of the way that the East hadn't dealt with um, the communist past, that became part of an argument in Nuremberg of, whoops, uh, we haven't done too well about ours afterwards. And then um, yeah, in 1989, that really became an added push for doing something. So it kind of worked in two ways. So on the one hand, it was, how can we be so critical um, of uh, East Germany for the very ideological way in which the past has been dealt with when we've done something that anybody might say is extremely inadequate ourselves. So that was one, one drive towards it. But, but yes, it was also the case that in, um, in the, some of the um, proposals for what the content of the exhibition would be, that there was an attempt to frame it as totalitarianism. Um, that then, in the end, it does. It, it, it that sort of is diluted back into Nazism because of dealing with the very specific uh, side. But yeah, that was part of the arguments, definitely. Yeah. So thank you for, for that question. Yeah. You surprised me a little bit. I think when you described the construction being so sort of shoddy. Yeah. I was just wondering, was that because they were put up hurriedly, or because? Uh, they had this notion that it was a sort of stage, and it didn't have to be that permanent. It was just there for mm. transient propaganda Um I think it was because, well, it, 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 the, the rhetoric is sort of mixed. So there's this, the Congress Hall, there's all this stuff about it being granite and stone, and it's going to last forever. So there's this rhetoric of it's going to be um, to last. But it was a stage, and the Zeppelin building in particular was made extremely badly. It was was really rapidly put up. So the kind of contradictory things um, going on. So in a way, a bit of both. It was put up quickly, and it was there basically as a stage. But still, it was this strange kind of language of, but it will last. Uh, for a thousand years, which was um, very unrealistic, yeah. Mm. Um, I agree with the architects that the buildings that Stalin built, the Seven Sisters, mm. Moscow State University, the Moscow subway, the Moscow or the canal, I've heard positive things said about both the workmanship and the standards that the uh, people who constructed these uh, um, sites were, were held to at the time. Um, mm. uh, how do you account? I, I don't know that much about um, who built. I, I would assume that there was some slave, uh, some labor uh, involved in the buildings in those uh, mm. uh, structures. That was a gulag people or something. Mm. I really don't yeah. know. Yeah. But given the regime, I would 
pursuing that. But how, how do you account for the fact that did the, did the Nazis just have lousy people up at the top? And uh, I know Hitler had <laughs> yeah. a, a policy of delegating responsibility, and maybe Stalin didn't quite have that yeah. idea. Can you, have, can you say anything? Because it's interesting that the sort of evaluation of what was built by these two totalitarian regimes seems to be very different. Yeah, I think I've over-exaggerated, sir. Oh, yes, I've forgotten all about repeating the questions. I'm sorry. This was um, a question about the, the, the comparative workmanship of um, uh, uh, in, in uh, Stalinist Russia versus in, in, in Nazi Germany. Um, and on that, I should say, I've probably exaggerated the, the, the rubbish construction of um, these buildings. The Zeppelin building isn't well built. The Congress Hall is built much better. So there was change over time as well. And there was also part of the question was about um, the labor for that. Yes, slave labor uh, was used. And I mean, stone came from miles and miles. So uh, one, for some of it, there was this real kind of um, attempt to get absolutely the best products. And that was going on. And some buildings are very solid and you know the massive foundations that were dug for the great German stadium so that was going on too but especially as as, um, as time went on others were put up much more hastily but they still often came under the same kind of rhetoric so it isn't just that there was just one strategy and I think that it, yeah it wouldn't be right to, for me to imply that they were all <laughs> very poorly built so yeah sorry question question yeah. Um, I was struck by your description of the project or the proposal to turn the Congress Hall into a hotel and disco and all these mm. things. And I guess I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about you know the stakes of the, those debates, thinking not only of this Weimar project mm. that you referred to, but I think if memory serves that Baptist Garden has been taken over by Intercontinental, yeah. um, you know, a pretty notorious site, and yet that has been privatized and. Yeah. You know, there's a lot in that debate too, but I guess what I'm wondering is, you get a sense that there's there's a sea change in what is possible in terms of conservation of memory and this sort of thing, and mm -hmm. you think these proposals might have gotten a lot more traction if they had been made in 2005. And, you know, I'm wondering what, yeah. whether something has majorly shifted or whether these are too vocal to general. I really, it's, it's such a good question, and it's something I've thought about, and I really am not sure. So I think there is a, lo there is a local thing, so I don't think you could do just the same thing everywhere. But I, I suppose there was one bit, the one thing I wonder is whether there's also maybe a sense, we've done enough now, we can now start doing some of these other things. Though if, I suppose the particular cases, so like, um, with Hitler's eagle's uh, nest, the lair in Berchtesgaden. It is partly over who owns what and that sort of thing as well that allows certain things. So um, I don't know, but it could be. I don't know. We have to wait and see if more and more there are more cases like this. Um, it's hard to know. Um, so there was a question there and then one there. Well, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about mutilation as a way of dealing with the past between destruction and forgetting, and possibly in relation to monumental ruins, and then this image that you have in your book of grass on the stones. Mm. Um. Yeah, weeds and grass. So this, yeah, question about um, the mutilation of buildings um, and the damaging of them and so on. I mean that, yeah, when I referred to it as this amputation, I mean that isn't, wasn't how it was talked about at the time, so that is my um, interpretation of that. Um, but I think, the yeah, the, I mean, uh, there has been an attempt to sort of disarm the buildings in various ways. Um, and I think that was the effect of, in this case, of that, that bombing, whether um, 
it, whatever the reasons exactly were for doing so. Um, yeah. Um, but yes, and I think in many ways these things do disrupt um, how the buildings look. So something like, so, so one thing with the Zeppelin building is you, there are loads and loads of weeds that are growing out of the cracks and things. And when people come and visit, it's something they often comment on. And it's, to some people, it's a sign. I had one, um, there was a Spanish visitor who said to me, um, the, uh, this idea of grass growing on the building, it's like they're grassing over the history. It, it was see, interpreted as this, uh, this idea about neg neglect and so on. So I think these are sort of things that are happening uh, to the buildings. They could be treated in other ways, but they also do become sort of metaphors for people to think about and to then kind of extrapolate about wider matters like how is the city, how is the nation dealing with its past. They're sort of very potent um, materialities that are there to be interpreted. I don't know if I've quite answered what you got at, but this is ho hopefully a bit. Uh, sorry, question there next, yeah, I think. I, I haven't seen the documentation center, but uh, it sounds like you describe it um, to me as a German, very German, to come to a little overdetermined, very serious solution, wanting to do it right. And what came to my mind during your talk were some of these really very skillful filming parodies of the site, which are in a way sound mm -hmm. superior to me. I'm thinking of um, mm -hmm. the sequence, I don't know who knows it, in, in Germany away. An American re-education film where three soldiers march just the same way as uh, Hitler, Himmler, and Lutze in, in the Riefenstahl's mm. film in a completely empty, destroyed uh, a stadium or, or towards the uh, building from which the swastika is already blown up in the rain. Very funnily edited, or when we think of uh, the Lee Wilder's uh, parody of Leni Riefenstahl's first sequence mm. with a plane flying over Nuremberg and his plane flying over the destroyed Berlin. I mean, this is so much more playful and mm. effective, too, that I wonder, couldn't one come up with something similar in such an exhibition? It, it sounds a little overburdened mm. with wanting to do it right. It's serious, yeah. I mean, it is. Um, and I... I think that the people who were involved in that feel that is the right uh, strategy there. But that doesn't, uh, yeah, I mean, that in some of the, uh, the sort of installation artworks that there have been as well, actually most of them haven't been very playful actually thinking of the examples. But sometimes visitors reclaim it in playful ways. One interesting thing that happens on guided tours is that you're told um, that there's there's a very big road that goes down the centre that's made of of granite and each um, and it's a great big granite slabs and you're told that these are designed so that each slab is the step one Prussian officer's step and guides encourage you to try out doing your goose stepping, um, which is, is an interesting thing to try out. Um, and this actually, people are often extremely self-conscious and uncomfortable doing this until they sort of get into it. Um, and this, um, is, this does generate that kind of humor. And actually, the guides encourage that. So there are people who will play. And, and I mean, it is recognized that there's something potentially pedagogically important about letting people laugh at things. And some of the stories that they tell as well about um, you know, on these parades, it was just the beautiful uh, Nazis at the front and they put all the others at the back and these are supposed to kind of puncture the imagery and, and so on and, and, then they, and some of those things are done in ways to make you laugh at it. So there is some of that and I, I agree it can be a powerful strategy but I think if they'd done it there in that exhibition I, I think that would have been an incredibly hard thing to pull off really. I, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I think there's some other things they could have done, but I don't think they had that much room for manoeuvre, really. Yeah. I know someone else had their hand up. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Um, 
specimens left in ruins. Mm -hmm. um, Nuremberg, I've been to this site. Um, my German friends had a little trouble explaining to me the different stages of thought that I've gone through. And then when you go to Berlin, it's really hard to find where the old wall was. Mm, I saw more yeah. of the wall at the first museum in DC mm. than I did the whole time mm. I was looking at Berlin. So is there not any continuity with the federal government as to preservation, conservation, memory? Is it typically local? Uh, yeah, it's usually either city or state in this, you know, and that means like Bavaria or Baden-Württemberg or something. It's, the, there's, yeah, there, there are some um, uh, organizations that try to make things happen beyond the, the local and including international ones, but really the main responsibilities don't lie at that level. And why um, do you think that is? Why isn't there more input from the German government itself? Well, that's really just, I mean, the structure of how German politics and statehood work, really. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that doesn't mean, though, that there won't be encouragement and things. And, I mean, what, what, the way it worked in Nuremberg was, it was quite interesting for those who wanted to make something happen. They kind of would bring in big politicians to visit from... Um, yeah, from Berlin or from Munich and so on. So it, it, it kind of can work in, in that sort of way, but it, yeah, it tends to work more from, from the local, uh, really. Mm. So a question at the back there. Uh, I'm curious about the approach used to commemorate the past um, with an emphasis on documentation and without artifacts. So do we, um, do we see this at other sites to collect memory around the world? And if so, what is the rationale um, within the framework? If I heard you right, because there was a sudden clinking in the background, you, it was a question of, about the emphasis on documentation rather than objects. Yeah. Is that right? Um, uh, and how what widespread is that? That's a really good question. Uh, I think sometimes these sorts of topics, there is a preference. Um, I mean, sometimes it's just because of what the, the rich sources are. Um, I think that the really active avoidance of objects um, in this case was partly a special thing because there was this idea here that things, uh, there's this sort of idea about this enchantment that things might have, um, which I think you don't get to the same extent in other cases. I'd have to think about exactly which examples, though. I mean, there's certainly others that do put most of their emphasis. I mean, you, you know, you go to an exhibition that's mainly photography and uh, so on. And I think often with um, exhibitions about atrocity and things, that is a major uh, mode of um, representing those. Uh, but I don't know that the, the kind of reasoning and arguments would always be just exactly the same. But yeah, it'd be interesting. I, I should go and look for more examples. Thank you. Well, I, I should thank you all very, very much for just extraordinary questions. And, um